This week, Real Foot Forward is brought to you by our friends at the University of Tennessee at Martin. UT Martin offers more than 100 academic areas of study within 18 undergraduate degree programs. Contact UT Martin today to find a program that's right for you. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I have a guest today that I did not live, know live nearby, but I am so excited to uh, meet him. Charles Brubaker is a cartoonist and animator. He's had work published um, all over the place. Uh, one area one magazine he published in Mad Magazine, which when I was a kid, um, or maybe an older than a kid, a, a young teen, I loved Mad Magazine. And I also tried my hand at being a cartoonist. So he has greatly succeeded in an area that I greatly failed at. So really excited to talk to Charles. Welcome, Charles. Hey, nice to meet you. So let's go all the way back to the very beginning before we get into your uh, cartoonist work. Uh, I know that you uh, were uh, either born or grew up in Japan. Tell me a little bit about your childhood. Yes, I was born and raised in Japan uh, a long time ago now, I guess, <laughs> depending on your point of view. And yeah, I lived in <laughs> I lived in uh, southern Japan in the Kyushu. Uh, I was near Nagasaki, and I was, you know, I was born in a Japanese American family. You know my dad's from Pennsylvania. My mom's from Japan. So we grew up in a multicultural house. I now, where did, they, where did they meet? Uh, the, I think they met at a, my, my dad taught at a university in Isahaya, which is in the Nagasaki prefecture. And I think that's where my parents met. You know, my dad was teaching at Tennessee Wesleyan. Origin, my dad taught at Tennessee Wesleyan originally before the moved to work in Japan and what was supposed to be a, you know, a three year, you know, thing ended up lasting about 20 years, I believe. <laughs> and so he, so he obviously uh, was interested in Japanese and Japanese culture um, before he moved over there. Um, and I mean, it was he f fluent in the language? Uh it was just enough to get around. I guess it was, you know, my mom did, my mom handled most of the Japanese, you know, related <laughs> work pretty much. Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah. so uh, you were born, um, you were raised there in Japan. Um, at what age did you end up moving to the United States? Oh, well, you know, we, you know, we still flew back and forth between U.S. and Japan, you know, every year during summer, but. We bought a house in Martin, '97, I think. You know, you know, we still, you know, we were still, you know, flying back and forth between U.S. and Japan. But you know, we bought a house in Martin in '97. We permanently moved here, 2008, and been here ever since. So. And what was your dad? Um, what, what, what? Uh, he was not from this area. What? Why? Why Martin? I think. Well, you know, I think he. You know, he got a job teaching in Tennessee Wesleyan, which is in East Tennessee. Then I think he knew somebody who worked at UTM and, you know, he briefly taught there. So I think it was just through luck and connections that, you know, we went to Martin, you know, by UTM. So what kind of uh, uh, culture shock did you go through when you per moved permanently to Martin, Tennessee from Japan? No, well, I guess... <laughs> Well, it's a lot, lot. All the buildings are a lot more spaced out, for one thing. You know, and how in Japan, everything's, you know, all the buildings are much more closer together because, you know, it's, it's a much smaller land. So, you know, it's a lot more open space, you know, here than when I lived in Japan. And so, uh, what, what uh, roughly what age were you when you moved here permanently? Uh, 18. I was, oh, wow. You know, it was the year I started you know, my semester at UTM. Gotcha. So that was probably different education. I'm sure is a little different. Well, yeah. Yeah. 
Although, you know, I I went to a school, an American school of sorts at a, there's a Navy base in Sasebo, a U.S. Navy base. I went to school there before we switched to homeschool. And so there were some, you know, getting used to because I've been homeschooled for so long. But I, after a while, I got the hang of it, you know, at UTM. So a- were you were you drawing um like even as a as a young kid, you know, in Japan, did you immediately take to cartooning at a young age? Oh yeah, absolutely. I drew all the time. When I was a kid, um, I would just buy huge pieces of white poster board and just black sharpies, yeah. and I would literally spend hundreds of hours cartooning on you know little tiny cartoons all over. What kind of uh, what kind of uh, cartooning were you doing as a kid in Japan? Oh, yeah. I did a lot of newspaper style strips because we, you know, I was still able to see, you know, comic strips. And when I lived in Japan, you know, both through the Stars and Stripes newspapers and online. So I got, you know, like you, I I would draw on markers on paper a lot. Then did you, um, I know now you've got some really successful comic strips. Did you um, invent characters and do comic strips at the time? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had a few, you know, characters I would try to do. And, you know, I might do a few dozen strips, you know, at a time when I was a kid. Did you uh, uh, get anything published anywhere? Like any uh, Japanese? Uh, No, not in Japan. But I, you know, when I was 15, I did get uh, some cartoons published at a really, really tiny newspaper and, and a, in a newspaper that's near Murfreesboro. Uh-huh. I, I just found the contact information on it. I just sent them and they agreed to publish. And actually, you know, I actually got paid for that. So that was my first paying gig in cartooning, you know, when I was 15 at a very tiny newspaper just outside Murfreesboro. That's awesome. When I um when I first started college, um I had an, the idea that I could probably get published in small newspapers easier than large newspapers. And so I had some things published in the newspaper in Somerville, Tennessee, which is um a small town um a little ways outside of Memphis. So um it was a uh, it's nothing quite like seeing your work uh in print, right? Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you're when you're that young, mm-hmm. so you showed up in um, you showed up um, here uh, in Northwest Tennessee, and you had this passion. Uh, did you were you concerned at all that UT Martin might not have the classes that I'm? Uh, what, what did you major in? First of all, let's talk about that. Uh, graphic design. I have I majored in graphic design at UTM. So were you at all worried that? Um, you know, a rural, a college in a rural community wasn't get really going to have what you needed uh, for that major. Uh, it was kind of, mm, I never, maybe I had some concern, but I'll, I'll, you know, ultimately, you know, if it, if it gave me the necessary knowledge, you know, to get through, you know, I didn't think too much about it in the long run. Like, you know, like the graphic design classes, you know, taught me the, how to use the, you know, necessary softwares to, you know, create for digital arts needs. So that was a major plus for me. And this was around, tell me again, what, around what, what uh, year this was when you started? I started in 2008 and graduated in 2012. Wow. Okay. Very cool. So, so computers, I'm a whole lot older. So when I was, when I was first learning, we didn't have really computers at all. And um, at, at the University of Memphis, we even had like giant plastic sheets of rub on letters that we had to use if we wanted to to make text. So uh, it was a whole different world. And I want to talk in a minute about about you know the different techniques. But um and so while you were at um the university, did you uh they they obviously have a have a uh newspaper. Did you start doing uh cartoons there? Uh yeah, yeah. The newspaper at UTM is called the Pacer and I did draw, you know whatever cartoons I had, you know, while there. At the time, were you doing more um, strips or political or what type of uh, work were you doing in college? 
I did a, I had a brief stint doing political cartoons, but I didn't really enjoy it that much because political satire was not my strong suit. So I did maybe for some one, just one semester, but I switched to regular comic strips almost immediately after. Which and is, the, the the ones that you had, the ones that you um, are successful and known for now, did they come out of, of around that time or was that later? Uh, that was later. I had a couple of different strips at the Pacer, and one was about a rabbit, you know, because I was drawing, I was just doodling rabbits at the time, and the other was kind of a bunch of different. I had a bunch of different college students hanging out, but. You know, I didn't really have a name for them or anything. It was just, you know, just a group of college students doing whatever. So those are those are my two strips, you know, at the Pacer. Well, that was cool. Um, I remember um, the, I have this memory of my I had cartoons in the uh, Helmsman, and it was a huge rush to one time. I was uh, in a class and I saw somebody open up the newspaper to one of my cartoons and they read it and then smiled. And I've always remembered that smile, you know, just because it was such a, uh, such a buzz to see somebody smiling off of, from something I had drawn and put in the newspaper. Um, is that, uh, do you, do you relate to that at all? Oh, oh, definitely. I, yeah, that's always a great feeling. And so, um, did you? So you drew all through uh, the university, and you graduated from UT Martin. Yes. And um, your degree was graphic design. Did you plan to leave and and uh, go elsewhere, or did or was staying close by always part of the plan? I did plan on leave. You know, traveling around. Like I, I tried. You know, I was in. California for about a month trying to see if I could get a job in animation and that didn't work out. I had to you know go back but it did plant a seed to one of my later freelance jobs which ultimately helped me start you know my self-employment you know going so I was able to get something going you know with the benefit of being able to do it in West Tennessee so was that, um, I know that you worked um, on the Pink Panther book by Jerry Beck. I, oh yeah. I, I basically helped out, you know, identify, you know, helping them find the cartoons because at the time they weren't on DVD. So I have to, and I happened to have a bunch of them on VHS tapes. So I, I would, so I helped them, you know, find the cartoons, you know, because they weren't on DVDs at the time and also identify the, production drawings and whatnot. you're probably one of the few people he could have found that had a bunch of pink panther cartoons on vhs tapes yeah pretty <laughs> much, i think i pretty much was at the time yeah, so, rem yeah. remember so, remember vhs tapes <laughs> exactly yeah and i mean for anybody who for anybody who's listening who you know has forgotten or who maybe isn't exposed can you talk a little bit about um, Pink Panther, and since you obviously learned a lot about it from working on the book. Oh, oh, Pink Panther. Well, yeah. co well, of course, you know it was, you know, it was made by the DePatty Frilling Studio, which was a animation studio, you know, made up of ex Looney Tunes animators. Because this was after Warner Bros. decided to, to stop making new cartoons, so so the animators were out of work, so they formed a new studio and and. Blake Edwards was doing that movie about the diamond theft, you know, the Pink Panther diamond theft, mm -hmm. and wanted yeah. a car cartoon intro. So they, you know, hired the animation studio to make the opening titles and it ended up being such a huge hit. They decided to make an entire cartoon out of it. And the first, the first Pink Panther cartoon, the Pink Think, won an Oscar. And that basically, you know, got the studio rolling. You know. Yeah, I can uh, I can hear the theme in my head while we're talking. Oh yeah, the Henry Mancini theme. It's, yeah, it's, that's an that's an iconic classic. So how did you end up uh, connecting uh, with Jerry Beck to do this? No, well, we no we you know I've been writing to him a few times online, and you know we since we both like you know we both interested in classic animation and just kind of 
you know, went from there. And I, you know, we still talk, you know, about obscure animation and, and I try to help them find information if possible. And, yeah, you know, it was just, you know, just, you know, writing to him often. Um, and so speaking of classic um, animation and classic um, cartoonists, who who would you say is either your favorite or a, a few of your favorites uh, from history of cartooning? I have a lot to name, but Charles Schultz of Peanuts is a major influence. And I'm also a huge fan of Wizard of Vid by Grant Park and, was, and Johnny Hart, you know, who also did BC and I'm also, you know, of course, Mad Magazine as well, like Paul Coker, Sergio Aragones, Jack Davis, you know, they're all huge influences. Yeah, I always loved uh, Charles Schultz. I could draw. That was one of the things that I tried to learn how to draw is all of those. Um, and then the far side, I always loved the far side. Oh, yeah. Gary Larson was great. <laughs> yeah, I used to, when I was a kid, I would collect books and cartoons and and all those things. Um, so. Um, do you today like do you still like you know do research and collect books are you still into the history of uh cartoons oh yeah absolutely i I got way too many books at this point (laughs) now i'm curious um you mentioned mad magazine and of course i was a huge mad magazine you know i collected the cards and the magazines and, and things like that so um how did you end up with uh some work in there i well, at the time, Mad had a section called the Strip Club. That's where they published a bunch of different, you know, comic strip format, you know, gags. And I sent a few ideas I had, you know, to the guy who was in charge of that. And he liked some of them enough to publish them. So it was, you know, I just sent, you know, I lucked out, you know, sending, you know, him materials you know, to his office. Um, I'm going to, as soon as we get back from the break, I'm going to ask you some questions about, um, how, how somebody goes from, you know, coming up with the ideas in their head to having it be put into a magazine. So, um, so stay tuned. We'll, We'll be right back. Hundreds of students experience real world learning at UT Martin. Faculty members pair students with the perfect internship, clinical, or educational placement that best suits their area of study. Visit utm.edu to learn more about UT Martin. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast catcher of choice. It helps us share Real Foot Forward with even more people. Today, I'm talking with Charles Brubaker, a cartoonist and animator who lives in Martin, Tennessee. We were just talking about Mad Magazine. Um, I'm, I'm curious, Charles, um, today, so, you know, we talked about how I dabbled long, long ago. Um, today, how, how talk, talk me through the process of how someone like you who now has a degree in art and you're super talented, super published, how does an idea go from your head um, and how does it get out into the world using uh, today's technology? Uh, well, it's, of course, it would, of course, depending on, you know, what, you know, where your, your outlet is. Like, you know, for Mad Magazine, for example, you know, I would sketch out an idea. I would sketch out several ideas and send to the editor. And, and you know, they were, they would fine tune everything. So, you know, if they liked the idea enough, you know, they would tell me how they could improve it, improve it, and what I should do. So I would. So it wasn't unusual for me to, you know, rewrite and you know re-edit multiple times until they finally, you know, decide to go with it. And, and if it's my own work, you know, I would, you know, I would, like with Fuzzy Princess, you know, I would plan out, you know, the story. You know, I would write down the outline in great detail and you know, and get, get it focus tested with, you know, some of my friends, you know, who would give me suggestions, which I would incorporate in. And then, then it's a matter of drawing it out, coloring it, and then posting it, you know, on the schedule. And how much of your actual production that you do, how much is 
Um, you know, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, back in the, you know, back in the olden days, you know, cartoonists um, had certain kind of pens that they used, and they would dip them in ink, and they had certain kinds of paper, and they would do them certain sizes, and you know. Um, I, I've not been around cartoonists much in decades now. How, how do you do it today? Oh, well, f- with Fuzzy Princess, you know, I actually do all the inking on paper. Let me start. Like, I actually, you know, I would have a, I would do the rough pencils on computer using Clip Studio Paint. I have templates, you know, with the panel borders where I could rearrange and, you know, if needed. And then I would sketch it out and then I would type the dialogue so I know how big the word balloon should be. And then once I'm happy with the sketch, I would print it out, you know, on blue ink, blue non non reproduction ink, and then ink it using a variety of pens I have. Like I've used markers and fountain pens, you know, occasional brushes. And then once the page is inked, you know, I would scan it back in and you know, make any adjustments if necessary and add the dialogues or the color and and then and then render you know then render the finished page so I could post them online and then you send you send like digital files off and they drop them in um, to be printed or I mean is is what I guess most of your is most of your work printed or is some of it just strictly digital um, online of the of the non animation that you do a lot of it is digital yeah but i always make sure to save higher resolution files you know because i always because i work under the assumption that everything i do will be printed in some form or another so you know it's good to future proof it you know so i mean obviously the world you know comics and and cartoons started off in newspapers there's a huge transition in the world of newspapers uh, that obviously impacts uh, cartoons as well and as somebody who who always every sunday you know got the newspaper out and read the cartoons first um, when i was a kid before anybody else even got to the newspaper um how is how is how is um, the world of cartoonists? How are you responding to the changes in how people are getting their information? Oh yeah, it's it's a lot different now. You know, I always try to you know be at least you know at least understand you know the digital trends. Like I you know I was at a you know discussion panel with a bunch of you know online comic creators and one person. You know, who's been doing online comics for 20 years, you know, say, you know, always assume that, you know, the rules of that the trends in social media will change every six months, mm. you know, because it really does change rapidly. So he he works under the assumption that, you know, the method he's doing now will become obsolete in about six months. And I don't you know, I'm not that well in tune, but I kind of understand, you know, what he means. And I try to keep that in mind. So. So I try to, you know, pay attention, you know, to best of my ability. Yeah. I mean, I know that, you know, um, in best case scenario, uh, in the olden days, um, cartoonists would be syndicated and they would get paid by, you know, there were one or two major, maybe three big syndication companies and they would Mm -hmm. have certain cartoonists on their, on their quote unquote payroll and they would pay them for that. How, how is a cartoonist in business today? How do you put food on the table with cartooning? That's uh, yeah, it's very it varies widely, but I know quite a few newspaper cartoonists are doing graphic novels and children's book now. So, like a lot, there are still comic strips picked up for syndication today, but I think they're syndicated under the assumption that they'll be reprinted in books, and that's where most of the revenue comes from book royalties. Hmm. So, um, also, I mean, just like just like newspapers are changing drastically, um, book book publishing is too, and the, you know there are less publishers and they are doing uh, less niche work. Um, are any cartoonists that you know of dabbling in self publishing and selling? You know, because you can sell direct to Amazon now. Um, is that a thing? Oh yeah! Oh, absolutely! It's very common. Like even with you know cartoonists who have major 
you know, book deals, you know, self-publishing has gotten so easy that almost, I think almost every comic creator is, you know, major, both the majors and, you know, the minor leagues, you know, self-publish in one form or another. Now, I know, so you've got, um, I know you've got multiple series that, that are ongoing. Like one is the Fuzzy Princess, one is Ask a Cat. Mm-hmm. Um, do, are you planning anything with those like in self-publishing? Oh, yeah. I self-published, you know, several books, you know, with both of my comics. Like you can get both Ask a Cat books on Amazon and you can, you know, and I, I'm also selling, you know, the Fuzzy Princess books directly from me, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there are. Oh yeah, they're available very much. Um, well, we need to get some in our store here at Discovery Park, um, oh. since you're local, especially. Um, so tell me, tell me some more about Ask a Cat. So I we used to have two cats. Uh, <laughs> you're obviously, um, I'm assuming you're a big um, cat fan. I have. We have six. We have six <laughs> cats in oh the household. Gosh. So yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> you have six cats, um, and. Um, uh no dogs oh we have yeah we have three dogs so yeah <laughs> so so this is literally an animal house <laughs> <laughs> no doubt oh yeah uh, where did they all come from oh well, well one of the cats we brought one of the cats and one of the dogs you know we brought from japan you know when we moved here we actually you know we took our pets here and so one so we got two pets from japan and Others, you know, they just kind of hung out around the house and we just let them in. And and the two dogs we adopted. So, so it was it was a natural it was a natural outgrowth of your day to day life to start a comic strip about a cat. Can you sort of summarize the comic strip for anyone who hasn't had the chance to read it? Oh, uh, it's Ask a Cat is where you can finally get answers from cats. You know, the the basic premise is somebody would write a letter to a cat and he would answer, you know, in a very cat-like fashion. <laughs> like, <laughs> like what, like where does cat, like if dogs go to heaven, where do cats go or <laughs> that sort of thing. And why do cats need all the time? You know, that sort of thing. And I, uh, I know that you have the email address, go ask the cat at gmail.com. Do you get a lot of questions uh, asking cats? Oh, yeah. I still get emails today. So, yeah, people still, you know, send in questions, you know, whenever they can. <laughs> and you clearly have uh, lots of uh, inspiration there um, for the cat. What, what, um, I know that you also did some work for SpongeBob. Oh yeah, I did. That was that was really fun. Yeah, tell me a little bit about that. I'm um I you know, SpongeBob is getting a little more into the era when I had kids. Um so <laughs> yeah. That, my I had girls and they didn't particularly watch SpongeBob SquarePants too much, but um how how did how did that go? I'm looking at some of the uh strips online that you did for them. Oh yeah, so you know, I mentioned before that I went to Los Angeles in an attempt to get a job at animation studio as well. I met a bunch of people there. One of them was a gentleman named Sherm Cullen, who was a, I think still is a storyboard director, a head writer on SpongeBob, the TV show. And he, you know, we were talking and he mentioned offhand about the comic books, you know, which he has worked on as well. And, and how they would hire indie independent comic creators to draw spongebob and their style because they're because they were very you know open to artists drawing spongebob and their style and i had that i had that in mind so i asked him for more information he got me in touch with the editor and so i showed the editor some of my you know comic works and he liked them and so i started contributing to the magazine you know through that it's great your stuff is so good Thank you. Um, I'm so jealous. Um, you're so talented. Um, so I've, I'm, I'm looking at that, the fuzzy princess to ask a cat. Um, and there's a lot of others. What, what, what is your favorite? What is your favorite thing to draw? My favorite thing to draw? Uh, cats. <laughs> <laughs> so you yeah, just draw all kinds. Of, when, when, you're, when you've got some downtime and you can just draw whatever you want, 
You draw cats? Yeah, pretty much. You know, just doodles of, you know, cats, you know, big or small. You know, they're just, it's kind of my default drawing, you know. You know, if I need to draw something, it's kind of, that's where I go to by default. Do you ever sit down um, to your drawing board and just um, not, nothing seems to want to come out? So you just walk away or, you know, what, what do you do to, to end up with such great work? Yeah. If I, you know, if I'm having a slow day where I can't think of anything, you know, I would just, you know, walk out, walk, walk, just pace around, you know, maybe walk outside for a bit or watch whatever is on Netflix or YouTube, you know, and read a book there, you know, there are variety of ways, you know, I can, you know, unwind you know when i'm stuck like that so so what's your um what's your schedule like do you draw um every day just like people go to the office or do you work better late at night how how do you uh what's your uh what's your discipline like on this yeah i don't have a like a strict schedule you know like i would in an office but in general i think i would spend the day you know planning out ideas, you know, what to draw. And then I would do most of the drawing at night, you know, although there are times where I would draw during the day as well. So it's not consistent schedule per se, but in general, you know, plan during the day and then work on as much as I can during the night. And then I know you're also a, a, um, an animator who's done a lot of work in that area. Mm-hmm. Um, what, uh, what type of, um, animation work are you doing um but yeah but yeah i started you know animating in earnest you know last year you know you know with the covid pandemic you know i kind of had more free time and i've been wanting to do animation for us i decided you know uh you know nothing nothing to do as much as well do animation i mostly i've been animating you know doing animated version of my ask a cat strips you know mostly like and then Kind of a Looney Tunes, Looney Tunes, Rocky and Bullwinkle-ish, you know, style animation. And we'll we'll uh, link in the show notes to your show reel so people can kind of get a sense of the kind of work that you do. Uh-huh. Um, for for those of us that that are not clued in, how how do you what do you use to create this this work that you're doing in the animation realm? Oh, like what software I use? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, for the, from you know, the most of the animation I've done, I use Toon Boom Harmony, which is an industry standard in most TV animation. And although I, although I think I'm kind of a stickler for the line quality of my art because, you know, Toon Boom, you know, most animation studios is a very, you know, clean line art, and I kind of like my line art to be messy, so I had to, mess around with the brush setting a lot just to get the style on. But nowadays I've been using Clip Studio Paint, the mm-hmm. same software I use on my comics because they have a lot more, they have an animation tool that's really good and they have a lot more, you know, variety of brush settings, which allows me to get the kind of brush I am. So I've been animating with that, you know, lately and I'm planning to, so I plan to, you know, use that to make future shorts. Now, I know that um, you're a member of, you know, like the National Cartoonist Society, Mm -hmm. um, but do you feel at all, you know, you're somebody who's doing um, work in a rural community, um, whereas, you know, if you were in New York or, or LA, you would be around a lot, you could, you would have access to a lot of other people who were doing the same kind of work. How do you, how do you deal with, uh, trying to be a creative production person without a lot of local peers. Yeah, it's, well, all I could say is, you know, thank goodness for, you know, internet and s- social media because that allows me, you know, more options to communicate with them. But, you know, a lot of comic creators do live in small towns, so I'm not alone in that area at least, so. Uh, you know, every once in a while, you know, we can get together, you know, these days by Zoom meetings like this one. But it's, yeah, but it's a lot more easier to get in touch, you know, 
thanks to the web, basically. Are there are, are there other cartoonists that live near us here in Northwest Tennessee that I just don't know about? Uh, you know, Weekly County Press has a you know graphic designer named Beth Cravens, you know, who does political cartoons for a press. So mm-hmm. there's at least one other published cartoonist in Morton, Tennessee area. That's cool. And then I know, you know, there is an arts community here. I know there are some talented um, designers and, and artists and, and things like that. We have an incredibly uh, um, talented designer, Carly, here at Discovery Park, who also went to UTM. So um, <laughs> maybe we need maybe we need a, a creative people's organization here we can all connect at. Yeah, that might be. That would be neat. Yeah. So what's next for you? What what is the idea that you haven't started yet? We we like to hear it here first. So what's what's next for you? Uh, oh, right now my my goal is to make a fuzzy princess animated short. You know, this year I had this script written and lit and this past week I've been, you know, drawing out the design guides, you know, to help make the animation process easier on my end. So so th- so that's really my goal for 2021, you know, to get to get that cartoon made. You know, because it's it's also kind of a milestone because I started Fuzzy Princess five years ago hmm. you know, this year. So I kind of want to do this cartoon as a sort of a milestone celebration. Yeah, very cool. Well, we'll um, we'll keep an eye on your website and your social media. I know that if somebody wants to see the real, they're going to go to bakertoons.com, B-A-K-E-R-T-O-O-N-S.com. Um, I'm assuming you're taking advantage of social media and people can follow you there as well? Uh, yes, I'm, also, I'm on Twitter as well, you know, bakertoons, you know, same spelling. Okay. Well, we will, uh, here at Discovery Park, we're going to follow you. Um, mm-hmm. And then we need to get you over here at some point to speak to some young folks about um, um, opportunities um, for people who like to draw. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for talking to us on the podcast. Um, and um, thank you for everybody for listening. Yeah. And thank you for having me here. You bet. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoy this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates. 